Tell you what. Uh oh. <laughs> I, I read that novel by two women. Uh oh. Kathy says, Brother Lynn, is this the title? And I said, Yes, ma'am. How much do you weigh? She got offended at me. I said, Not you. I said, Not you. How much do you weigh? I asked Patty. I said, What do you think about this for a title? She said, Depends on who you ask it. I said, well, I'm not asking you. She said, it don't matter. You know how much I weigh. It's like, well, I'm not asking anybody, but I am. How much do you weigh? We've been on a journey, right? We've walked through two already. Faith of the fiery furnace. Where Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest king of the world, he ruled the world with an, iron, with an ironclad fist. No nation stood before him. All crumbled to meet them. All armies have been defeated on the field of battle. All gods from his perspective, perspective have been defeated. And so when he defeated the children of Israel, the greatest god of them all, and battle that is, he thought, how about that? I must be something. I mean, my armies must be the greatest armies of the world, and I must be the greatest king ever because I, I not only defeated their armies, I killed their kings, I tore down their city, I burned their temple, I mean, I messed him up. So I must have done something. And he took him captive. And then in the midst of this, he rose up by God's amazing grace four men that became leaders in ancient Babylon. Daniel, the prophet, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by their Babylonian names. And we spoke of the time that they built this 90-foot tall, 9-foot wide gold statue to Nebuchadnezzar. And it wasn't about his God, it was about him. Because he believed he was God. He believed that he was God over all things because he was the greatest human being on the face of God's good earth. He must be something. And God demonstrated in that experience. Excuse the English, you ain't nothing. I mean, you aren't anything. There is one God upon you. There is one God and only one God and you ain't it. And this one God is all knowing, this one God is all powerful, and every human being will crumble and bow before this God. And just to prove a point, remember what he did? Faith in the fiery furnace. Sometimes you don't know what you need until you get in the furnace. Amen? Sometimes we get released from bondage in the furnace. They did. We say, well, I, I don't get it. Let me help. It may be that there's something that's got you shackled. It may be that there's something that has you in bondage. It may be there's something that has you down, something that has you so entangled, so ensnarled, you can't let it go. It may be pride, it may be hate, it may be anger, it may be whatever. Fill in the blank for yourself. <clears throat> and God, God is such that God will put you in the furnace so that you understand what is going on, so that in the furnace sometimes you have given up hope on every other thing but Him alone. And when you come to the, to the point in your life when you have given up on everything but Him alone and you put your faith and your confidence in Him and Him alone because every other thing that you've tried has let you down and you say, God help me, God will. Amen? Amen. And so these three men stood and they said, be it known unto you. Remember the, remember the statement of the, the question. King Nebuchadnezzar looked down and saw these three men standing with everybody else was kneeling before this God. And he said, what God is there that can save you from my hand? Can I help you? <laughs> ah, there's a God above that can help all of us. Amen? Amen. I know his name to you. Amen. He's helped me. Has he helped you? I found freedom in the furnace. Amen? Have you? But I've seen bad days, y'all. Have y'all? I've seen bad days. And in those bad days, I found grace, and I found grit, and I found things that I did not know that I needed till I needed them. Amen? And so when I trusted every other thing that I could, and it let me down, and I came to Jesus, Jesus has never let me down. Amen? Amen. God's got this. You doggone right. And so in that experience, it wasn't, they knew, they said, be it known unto you, O King, God is going to release us from you. Now, it may be through death. But be it known unto you, we will not bend, we will not buckle, and we will not bow. So furnace if you can. And bless God, they tried and they couldn't. Isn't that good news? Tried and they couldn't. Remember the next one? Didn't see that coming, did you? Didn't see that coming. Nebuchadnezzar's like every one of us that are human beings. He forgot. Amen? Forgot. Now you would think that it would, this would be...
would be so impressive that it would make an indelible mark that, that no human being could ever walk away from. Wouldn't you? Hey, don't. Let's help. Has something happened in your life that you can't erase from the side of your soul? You can't no matter how hard you try. Amen? There's things that happened to me 40, 50 years ago that I still remember with crystal clarity. Okay? I don't remember what I ate for breakfast yesterday. But these things that happened to me 40, 50 years ago, I remember with crystal clarity. Amen? Why? Because it made an indelible imprint in my life and in my mind. And I cannot, no matter how hard I try, I cannot forget it until I lose my mind if that happens one day. But I was looking for a place. Remember that? That happened over 50 years ago. I still remember it. I remember where it was, when it was, and how it was. I remember the sights. I remember the smell. I remember everything about that experience. And you would think that that would be true about Nebuchadnezzar, but Nebuchadnezzar was God. And so Nebuchadnezzar had a dream a few months later. And in that dream, he saw this had a nightmare. This tree that filled the earth. All the birds nested in it. All the animals fed off of it. They were protected by this tree. And a watcher from heaven said, cut it down. Cut that thing down. For seven years that thing will die and that thing will stay as a stump in the ground. And after seven years of having been cut down and a stump in the ground, I'll let that thing have new life and it once again became a flourishing tree that filled the earth. And Daniel said, you, O king, are that tree. God raised you up and God gave you the ability and God gave you the power and God gave you the knowledge and God gave you the strength and the God that I serve and the God that I know, that God and that God alone rises up men and puts men down. Do not be so foolish as to think that you did it on your own. And Nebuchadnezzar so polite, he said, I appreciate that. Walked right outside and it says a year later as he was walking on the, on the towers, on the walls of that great city, looking down upon the city and the hanging gardens, he said, my, 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 look at what I did. And before the words got out of his mouth, an angel from heaven made this announcement. You stupid. He didn't quite say that, but he did say this. O king, you were given warning, and you did not accept that warning. Now you're going to live like an animal for seven years. And we'll see how you think about it then. Amen? Amen. And after seven years of living like an animal, God gave him back his mind. God gave him back his strength. God gave him back his gift. God gave him back everything that he lost. Bet you didn't see that coming, did you? And so God proves a point. Do not take advantage of my grace. Do not. Do not presume upon my grace. Do not take advantage of my grace. There's a God that sits in heaven. There's a God that lives in heaven. There is a God that looks down upon all human flesh. And there, there is a day coming, and it may be in this lifetime, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that there's one and only one God, and I'm it, and no other. And when we accept that, I'll bless you. If you don't, I'll get you. And you say, that's mighty ugly. You know, can I help them quit? We as parents do what we have to do to get our kids attention, don't we? Y'all help me, don't we? Have you ever whipped a child? Oh, come on now. Is there nobody in this place that's ever whipped a child? Of course you have. You've never put them in, you never disciplined them? Of course you have. So why in God's name is it so difficult to understand that if God has to get your attention, you've got to do it? Why is that hard to understand? God will get our attention. God will take us to the woods. God will do what God has to do to make us understand that there's one God and we ain't it. And when we obey and submit to God above, God to help us, God to heal us, God to do all manner of things for us. But if we ain't careful, we can forget. And if we ain't careful, we can forget that God sees, God knows, and God is God Almighty. There is no other equal. There's no other God like Him. Is that right? Okay. Now today, how much do you weigh? As we read the words of Scripture, and we can't, so we'll be reading out the Word of God to you. You can stand if you choose to, and that's okay. I'm reading on to the last part. I'll, I'll share the story with you through the rest of it. But the story is that Nebuchadnezzar's grandson was high and he lifted up. And in the midst of, a, of an outrageous, drunken feast, the man's hand appeared and wrote on the wall these words. Let me share it with you. Many, many 
Mikael, Mikarsa. And Daniel gives this interpretation. Mene, Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and has finished it. Mikael, thou art weighed in the balances, and you are found light and deficient, wanted. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, they clothed Daniel with scarlet, put a chain of gold around his neck, made a front of a mason concerning him, that he should be the third ruler of the kingdom. And in that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain, and Darius the Mede took the kingdom, and he being 63 years, or 62 years old, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. We get to start, you can see it. We'll walk through real quick. In 562 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar died. Nebuchadnezzar died would have it known and have it been touched by the hand of God Almighty came to grace. And in his personal testimony in the chapter that we read last week, in chapter 4 of Daniel, he gives the testimony of his salvational experience. Do you know what you're saying? Oh, come on, y'all. It's not a hard question. Do you know that you know that you're saying? Yes. I do. I may not can give you the I may not can give you the, the date, August the what I may not can give you the year. I can tell you where I met Jesus. I can tell you that at Liberty Baptist Church and College and Seminary, in Mississippi, and a ramshackle old Baptist church, I met Jesus on the front altar on a Sunday afternoon. I sat there that day. My my brother was married to the preacher's daughter. He preached the message some months earlier on John 3 16. God stuck a drove a nail in my heart and I couldn't get it out of that thing. And for months I had agonized over this thing about dying and going to hell. And that sermon he preached that morning got me. I drove home and I was crying. And I don't cry. But I was crying driving home that day. I got out of my car. When I got out of my car, my little mama all met me, my grandma. She walked up and she said, Sonny, what, what's wrong with you? And I said, Mama, I don't know if I'm going to I, I don't know, but I just know that if I don't get things right with Jesus, I'm going to die and go to hell, and I don't want to. She said, Sonny, boy, get back in your car, and you go let that preacher help you. So I got back in my car. I drove back over to the church. I get out of my car. My brother runs up to meet me, and I'm crying. And I don't cry. And he says, what's wrong? And I said the same thing. I don't know, man. All I know is that I don't want to die and go to hell. I, 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 I need some help. And he ran into the house and he got his daddy-in-law, Brother John King. Brother John walked out. He had his flip-flops on, his t-shirt, his big body. <laughs> and oh, Brother John is six foot five and weighs about 300 pounds and it ain't fat. He's a big old dude. And he grabs him by the arm and says, come on, boy, let's go. And we walk across the street to Liberty Baptist Church. We go in there and he breaks open and he says, this is what God says. And he read me John 3, 16. And he read me the Roman road. Now I'm a preacher's kid and I know some things, but I gave up on God and church a long time ago, so I don't really care about the Bible. I don't really care about church. I don't really care, I don't really care but I, I know I need me something. You know what I'm saying? And as he's, as, as he's showing this God is speaking to my heart and God is saying, come on man, you need me. You need some help, brother. You need something. And I had the good sense to say, I need Jesus. Amen? 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 I don't know how to pray, but I can almost tell you my prayer. Lord, Brother John said that if I ask you, you'll save me. I need some saving. I know I'm a bad person. I know I've, I've done bad things. I don't want to die and go to hell. I do want to go to heaven. Help me, Lord Jesus, help me. And you know what? He did. Amen? Amen. He had. So I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. Amen? I know I am. I ain't perfect. But I know I'm going to heaven one day. And so Nebuchadnezzar wrote in his book that I have met the Lord God Almighty and bless God I'm different. Amen? Amen. I'm not what I was and I'm not what I'm going to be, but I'm a whole lot better than that. Amen? Amen. Okay. And so Nebuchadnezzar's life changed. His kingdom changed because he came to the Lord. And because he came to the Lord and he was a different king, people were freaking out. So he died and he gave it to his king, to his son. His, his son had seen the change in his daddy, ruled for eight years, and his son followed in his daddy's footsteps, even letting the king of Israel go free. His daddy had blinded Jehoiakim, Jeho Jeho blinded him, 
held his sons in his very eyes and took Daniel and the, and the rest of them into captivity. The last sight that he saw was his children and his army slaughtered in front of his eyes. But because Nebuchadnezzar had come to the Lord, and his son saw that, his son let that king free, brought him into the temple, put him into the palace, and gave him a place of honor. They were freaking people out. What are you doing? What are you doing letting these people sit at the, at the table with people light up like us? What are you doing letting people have sovereign rule in the lands that you... What are you doing? And since they couldn't wrap their minds around the goodness of God and human decency, they killed him. And another room, man ruled for a short time, another man ruled, and, and, and in the space of a few years, this guy, this general came on the, uh, on the, on the throne, Nabonidus. Nabonidus. He ruled from, five, from 556 to 439 B.C. He had a son, Belshazzar. So they're co-regents. Daddy was a warrior. He was not an administrator. He knew it. He let his son take care of business at Babylon, Belshazzar, and he was warring out there in the, in, the, in the lands around him, having all the fun he could stand until he met an obscure kingdom by the name of the Medes and the Persians. And at a, at a battle in Opus in 539 B.C., at this little bitty junction of the Tigris and Frates River up above Babylon in the north, about 80 miles north of Babylon, at a fork of the river, the Tigris, they met Darius the Mede and his armies, and they beat the Stephens out of Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar, the general and the king, took his armies and fled to the south so that he wouldn't lose everything. And he left his son Belshazzar and the kingdom in Babylon taking care of business. Now Babylon, Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar both believed the same thing. There, the, the city itself was 3,000 acres, y'all. 3,000 acres, that's a five mile square. The city was 3,000 acres. The wall was a double wall, 85 feet thick, 350 feet high, and surrounded by 100 towers that gave access to the whole city. They had years of supply. They had a river running through that thing, and they could not fathom that that city could fall. Do you, do you, do you get me? They could not fathom. They had conquered everything around them. They had ruled the world for almost a hundred years. Nothing could stand. Nothing had ever rivaled them. And so they could not fathom that Babylon could fall. So Belshazzar had a real good idea. He was going to show them what he was made out of. And he was going to try to follow in the footsteps of his grandpa. And so he threw a big shindig this night. And he, he brought together all of his royal officials, a thousand of them, brought their wives, country vines, and all that kind of stuff. Then he said, I got me a good idea. Y'all go down to the vault and you bring out the silver and the gold vessels from the temple of the God of the Jews because I'm going to do to the Medes and the Persians what my grandpa did to them folks. I'm going to show you who's boss. I'm going to show you who's king. I'm going to show you whose God is God. And so he made a fool out of himself so that he could save face in, the, in front of his people. Does that make sense? Okay. So he calls all these people together. He brings out these vessels, these holy vessels, consecrated vessels from the temple of God. And he starts having himself a drunken orgy. And in the midst of them, when things are just getting just real bright and real roaring, a man's hand appears. Boom. And as this man's hand, a hand appears, it begins to write on the plaster wall, the wall according to Herodias, the Greek historian, was 60 feet high, 200 something feet long of white plaster. And the hand does this number. Me, 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 take that with your And as he sees this hand, Writing on his plaster, Belshazzar freaks out. I will not share with you, but I will because it's funny. God does not hold back in the Bible, you know. He said the king looked over there and he so freaked out that his knees were smoking up, were smoking up against one another and he lost control of it. He's freaking out. And he called his men together. And he says, y'all come tell him what's going on. And nobody could. Nobody. Can I have help? Can I have us? Where do you go when you have a problem? 
Can I help you? If you don't go to Jesus, you ain't going to the right source. Amen? Amen. Now you can go to everybody else and they don't have the answer. They can pat you on the back and they can cry with you and they can do all kinds of things. But if you don't go to Jesus, you ain't going to get the answer. Amen? And so they said, I don't know what to do, King. We cannot figure this thing out. Now, Mama heard about it. Now, this is all about Belshazzar's mom. Mama heard about it. Mama comes from her royal suite, comes in there to this drunken orgy, walks up to her son and says, You know, your grandpa had a man in the kingdom by the name of Daniel, and he was a prophet of this Most High God, and he has already demonstrated and manifested that he is a man that can do, it to, do all kinds of things. Why don't we call him? So they called Daniel. And Daniel walks in there, and the king says, if you can do this, I'll do it. blah, 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 blah. And Daniel stands there, a, a great man of God, because Daniel knows what's fixing to happen. Daniel says, I tell you what you do. I tell you what you do. You just keep your promotions, because you ain't going to live too long. You can keep your gold, you can keep your silver, because it ain't going to do you no good. But I'll give you the interpretation. And then he begins to tell them about his grandpa. He says, you know that. He says, your grandpa, when your grandpa came to Jesus, your grandpa thought he was God. My God showed him he what? Amen? Amen. I said it before, I'll say it again. Has God ever taken you to the woodshed? Amen. Amen. Well, if God has ever taken you to the woodshed, do you want a second help of that? No, you do not. So he said, your grandpa was a good man, but your grandpa was stupid. So your grandpa thought that he was God and God showed him and showed him he was not. And you knew that. And you still act in a fool. Your grandpa lost everything and God set him up and God took him down. You knew that and you still act in a fool. God gave him back his kingdom. God gave him back everything that he took away. God blessed him and God blessed him because your grandpa had the good sense to look up and realize there's one God he wasn't in. And he bowed his knee, he humbled himself, and he looked up into the face of God Almighty and he said, There's one God, O Lord, you're it. I acknowledge that. I'm your servant. Do with me as you choose. Because of that, your grandpa was blessed. But you were stupid. So yeah, I'll give, I'll give you the interpretation. Me, 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 me. Your kingdom has been found in the sight of God, vicious, and of no value, and God has numbered your days, and your days are done. And He's going to finish this thing in short order. Because He's written it twice, that means that it's going to be done immediately. Me, name, me, name, to kill. How much do you weigh? <laughs> you have been weighed by God, and you have been a little short. Let me help you here. I have a wallet. That wallet does not belong to me. It belongs to whoever gets there before I do. Amen? All right, I'm just helping. I go down there to drink coffee. Amen? I go down there, I get my coffee, and I go to pay for it. I reach back, I pull out my wallet, and I realize that somebody's beat me to my money. Amen? And I said, it looks like I'm a little short. I know I'm a little short, but I mean, I, I, it looks like I'm a little short. Now, Colleen said, that's all right, Brother Lynn. You can just go and pay me later. I've done that several times. I go to the store. I reach back. I realize somebody got me my money for right there. And I say the same thing. Looks like I'm a little short. Let me tell you something. It's okay to come up short with everybody but Jesus. Amen? Amen. Everybody but Jesus. Because what Jesus does is he asks a broken question. I'll ask it to you this day. Because he asked it some several thousand years ago to a man that thought he had everything. How much do you weigh? Well, what do you mean? If God weighed your faith, how much do you weigh? Would you come up short? If God weighed your faith, if God weighed your grace, if God weighed your devotion, if God weighed your dedication, if God weighed your commitment, if God gave and weighed your integrity, if God weighed your honesty, if God weighed you, how much do you weigh? Most of us, if not all of us, would come up shy, wouldn't we? And so he asked the question, God has weighed you. God, that scares me. God has weighed you, and you're short. You've been found deficient. 
Your bank account is not existent. You've got nothing to draw from. Do you realize that we're fixing to bend our knee in just a second in communion? When you bow before Almighty God, do you know, do you not know that God's weighing you? Don't you understand that? God's weighing you. God has already weighed you. How much do you weigh? You say, Brother Man, I ain't worth it. You doggone right. This ain't about your word. It's about His word. Amen. None of us are worthy to bend the knee. None of us are worthy to break the bed. And none of us are worthy to take up a cup. None of us are. But because God, went, God gave His Son, His only Son, it's not about my word. It's about His word. I get to heaven on the coattails of Jesus. Amen? Amen? It's not about what I do. It's about what He did. If it's about what he did, it ain't about what I do. And since it's not, I don't have to worry about my worthiness. When I come, I come in the I come by grace through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. But the question is there. How much did he weigh? And since he could not answer into the affirmative, you say, well then let me help. You farce. Your kingdom has been weighed. You've been weighed. And God's fixing to wind this puppy up. I told you the city was five miles square. The palace was almost in the middle of it. When the Persians attacked Babylon, they knew that there was one way in that city, underneath the walls. The river ran beneath the walls, and what they did is they took a corps of engineers, they diverted the river, the Euphrates, from going up underneath the city, into a lake nearby. When they diverted that water, it took only a couple of hours for the water to diminish so that they could wade up under the gate. And they they got into the ditch, waded underneath these great big iron gates into the city. And by the time they got to the palace, nobody knew about it because it was so big and so fast, nobody could tell. And so when they, in the midst of this drunken orgy, as they look up after Daniel walks out, the next thing they know is the means and the person are knocking on the door. The king is killing all these royals, and they take over the kingdom. Amen. But they didn't see that coming, did they? We stand here this day, we stand here this day with a question. How much do you weigh? How much do you weigh? And if God weighs you, and He will, if God weighs you, and He has, do we not yet understand that we are sufficient, walking, and laughing? Might I help? You know what I did one day when I didn't have any money? I had a good friend of mine walk up and say, Brother Lynn, I got you. And he pulled out his wallet and he put a dollar down. And I said, man, I appreciate that. He said, it's all right, Brother Lynn. I got you. I got you. And it happened. 2,000 years ago, when you and I stood before the judgment bar of God, Jesus Christ, who suffered, bled, and died, walked up to the judgment bar of God. And he stood there and he put his blood, his blood, on the judgment bar of God. And he says to all that come up and plead, for mercy and plead for grace. Plead for forgiveness and plead for acceptance. For every one of us that bend the knee and every one of us that bow the head and every one of us that call out and know that I'm a sinner and I need some salvation. I need me some Jesus. For everybody that has and everybody that will, when we stand there, Jesus says, I know you're short. I got you back. Don't worry about it. And as he pays our freight for heaven, and as we walk away, he says this and only this. <coughs> but I would ask this of you. Since you're going to get to heaven on my coattails, don't you think you ought to act a little bit better? And don't you think you ought to do a little bit better? And don't you think you ought to serve some people? And don't you think you can love some people? And don't you think you can honor me? <coughs> Don't you think you could tell somebody about what I did for you? God bless you. We walked on.